it's always fun to introduce somebody you know. And uh, John Thompson is someone I've known for a while. Uh, we sent out his his credentials or uh, CV, whatever you want to call it, um, which is very short and does not in any way encompass the things he's done. Uh, John has a BA in geology and mathematics, uh, did field training with the University of, uh, of Miami of Ohio, and has a master of science in glacial geology, which will of course come out in his talk later. Um, and he's done so many things in just talking before we came over here this evening. He's even lived on an Indian reservation. I mean, I could just go on forever, but it would just bore you and it would just take away from the time he has, he, he has to talk. Uh, but he, he is a good friend and a, a, a wonderful speaker. Uh, he will be speaking tonight about pre-contact over. And I would like you all to give a hand and welcome John Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You could probably do this sitting down, but I'll get up and show my face. It's kind of cool out there, huh? Yeah. I think winter's hanging on a little bit. But I don't mind that. It kind of feels like when I crawled underneath the Athabasca Glacier in the middle of Canada and in the springtime. Um, so I'm not an expert on Dover geology, but I I think I know at least enough to be dangerous. Jeff, you might have to turn the light down a little bit. Um, let's pick presentation there. Uh, now I can start. Is that the first presentation uh, is presentation number two. Um, so I'm an environmental geologist, and I made a living cleaning up hazardous waste sites. In fact, one of, the, one of the sites that I did for mobile was the gas station in the Center Street in Dover. And that was more than 20 years ago, and I started working on that. And I got to be good friends with the owner of Dover Rug when he had a, his little shop that he had just started there. Uh, got to be friendly with him way before he moved over to Route 9. Um, but along the way, the, the town knew that I was a hazmat person. I spent two years as an incident response commander on the Mass Pipe, and what I did was I had to drive out to truck accidents on the Mass Pipe and tell fire departments how to clean up whatever spilled out of the trucks. And my town, Medfield, where I live, knew that I had that experience with hazardous materials, and they asked me to clean up or help guide the state in cleaning up the landfill that went along with Medfield State Hospital. When I was done working and I was the head mediator with the state, with DCAM, which runs all the state properties to clean up the landfill at the state hospital and built a park called the Overlook, the selectman said, you know so much about the hospital, why don't you just manage the property for us until we figure out what we're going to do with that? And um, that led to, for me, a nine-year odyssey of managing the state hospital. And along the way, I... I was lucky enough to be involved in the making of eight movies. And the last one I did last year was a movie called The Holdovers with Paul Giamatti. Um, I was involved with um, yeah, Alex, uh, the director, and the scout on picking out where they were going to film on the property. And I did an X-Men movie there. So the first presentation is about my work on movies at the State Hospital. But I'm going to try to show you the second one, which is um, about the glacial and, and indigenous people occupation um, in this part of Massachusetts um, during the whole, only Holocene, late Pleistocene. So this is a map that I just copied from Google, and you all know where you are, Google, Google Center. Is it pronounced Carol? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Carol, Carol yeah. Clark. I know he was uh, the first minister of the Springfield Parish. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. And his son was the first doctor. <clears throat> yes. Um, and I focused a little bit on Noannet and Coisset and Strawberry Hill for a specific reason, and I'll go through that in my talk. But I also will talk about 
the relationship between geography and indigenous people. When I talk about Native Americans here, I'm talking about the first Native Americans that lived in Dover as soon as the ice melted back, which is about 12 to 13,000 years ago. And there were many, there were not few. So let's get some background on glaciation. So this large area at the top of this slide this is a continental glacier in Greenland. And this is meltwater. And you've probably all seen shows recently on TV about loss of the ice caps and the results of sea level rise related to that. And as the ice melts back, it leaves these earth features, which are very raw. They're not vegetated yet. And then these shallow, um, this would be an ice contact margin where the ice is in contact with proglacial pro lake. And this is a cartoon that shows in cross-section the relationship between glaciers and the deposits underneath and in front of glaciers. So here's glacier and uh, here's your lake in front of the glacier and what's going on under the glacier. <laughs> the ice margin environment and the proglacial environment. This is the environment that indigenous people lived in, and they did live in ice contact environments. So Native Americans were living in along ice margins. This is a bit picture of a valley glacier, and you can sort of see the see the dirt here. Um, along the, the nose of the snout of the, of the valley glacier. And this is what you would see, say, in Mount Washington Valley as the, as the ice cap started to grow. Um, and the mechanics of a glacier is it's grinding along the bottom. And when you take walks to Dover and look at outcrops and they're very smooth, that's because the ice has ground over the top of those and smoothed the rock down. Um, and they, as we used to call them in school, the dirt machines, because they would literally bulldoze up and grind things from the bottom and literally push them up from the bottom up. And that's what you see here. As glaciers recede, you can see these lines um, on top of a glacier. If you've ever looked at a picture of one, there's these big crevasses that they talk about mountaineers falling into. That's because the glacier is under a lot of uh, extension and it's, it's pulling it apart and it's creating crevasses. The Kumbu ice field at Mount Everest is like that. It's a place where the glacier, which is almost like a plastic, is flowing down a valley and extending and creating these large crevasses. And that's unfortunately what some mountaineers fall into. This is a, a pro-glacial lake and these are the sand and gravel deposits in front of the glacier where they're slightly vegetated, but they're raw and they're open, but they also had wildlife, birds, mammals, or indigenous people to hunt and to live on. This is another picture of an ice contact margin of what's called an outwash plain. And if you've driven through the center of Medfield, Medfield, the very center of town, is built on an outwash plain, just like this. This is what it looked like 12,000 years ago. It was a flat, open plain of sand and gravel coming out of an ice contact margin where rocky woods is. And so the streams are coming out of that ice contact area, and it's just a big, flat, open plain and it was going into a glacial lake that filled in the Charles River Valley. So at a place called Turner Pond in Walpole, there was an ice dam, which created a lake in that Charles River Valley. And the lake extended all the way up um, in and around where Noannet and Powisset and Strawberry Hill is. That was at this uh, ice marginal deposits that were flowing into a surface water body and here's Noannet and Powisset and Strawberry Hill sticking up out of that lake where the water is. Okay. And so those areas were prime areas to, um, 
for indigenous people to hunt and live and survive. This is a, what's called the sufficial geology map of the Medfield Quadrangle. And it's hard to see, but it says Dover right there. So this is Dover. The different colors represent diff different deposits of sand and gravel that the ice left as it melted back. And so remember I mentioned that there was ice here at Rocky Woods and streams coming out of it onto a big open plain. This is the center of Medfield. This is Route 109. This is Route 27 before it had been finished. Um, and this blue is all the sand and gravel outwash that was coming out of the ice. So if you've ever traveled down Route 109 towards Millis, you'll notice at the cemetery, the Vine Lake Cemetery, that Route 109 starts to go down into a valley. And when you're driving down that slope, this Vine Lake Cemetery is on the top of the slope. As you're driving down that slope, you're driving right down what's called the Delta Front. And the Delta Front is the sand and gravel front that's filling in the lake, the Glacier Lake. And what ends up happening is, as the climate gets warmer, the ice dam at Turner Pond in Walpole, which is right at where, near where the border between Medfield and Walpole is, that broke on a single day and the entire lake emptied into the Neponset River Valley. And geologists know that because the banks of the Neponset River are very steep. And that's because a wall of water gushed through there and emptied an entire lake to the sea through the Neponset River. This is a close-up of that. This just shows the center of Medfield and the large delta in blue. These other deposits are the deposits on the side of the valley away from the center. So these are, when this was full of ice, you had streams flowing on the sides of the valley walls and creating these terrace deposits. And these terrace deposits are on Noannet, they're on Strawberry Hill, and they're on Poissip on the sides. These are gravel deposits that accumulated on the side when there was ice in the bottom of the valley. So let's go over and look at the Sufficial geology over in this part of Dover. Here's Noannet, Coisset, and Strawberry Hill. I believe that, no, not, if I'm not pronouncing Noannet right, let me know. But these two peaks, I believe that Noannet was a sachem of the Nipmuc Indians, the Natick Indians. And that's why, and his, where he lived was near here. I'll show that in a minute. but. These are the deltaic deposits in the lowland in the stream. This was Noannet stream that runs between the peaks at higher elevation. And this was, and then the Charles River is to the left here and wraps up around through Dover. This becomes prime hunting area. This is prime uh, living area. It's high elevation. It's also visible. And I'll talk about that, what I mean by visible, in a minute. Here's another reason why Noannan and Strawberry Hill and Powissip are important. Because the basement rock, the bedrock that's underneath these high elevation points in Dover, is a very special type of rock. It's part of what's called the Mattapan Volcanics. The Mattapan Volcanic rocks are rocks that were formed right at the beginning, near the beginning of the geologic time scale about 600 million years ago, when North America and Africa and South America were connected, but they began to split apart. And as the continents split apart into what we see today, there was a lot of volcanic action coming up from the, from the mantle in the earth, similar to what's going on in Iceland today. I would think you see the volcanic activity in Iceland, that's part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Very similar. So these three uh, high elevation points in Dover are made of volcanic rocks. They're not granitic, they're igneous rocks. And these rocks are very important to indigenous people and Native Americans 
because it's the source of their tools. And they needed these rocks in order to make their tools. And because they break, because they have a very high silica content. If you've ever seen a piece of black obsidian, it's almost, it looks like glass and it breaks in what's called a conchoidal fracture. It's very sharp. They were able to go to Noannit and Poisset and Strawberry Hill and mine these rocks, these volcanic rocks, and make their tools up. And they're called part of the Mattapan Volcanic Complex because the type locality for these volcanic rocks is just outside of Mattapan Square. But they're also the same rock as the Lynn Volcanics up in Lynn. It's the same magma that formed these, these rocks, even though they're we consider them to be kind of far away from each other. It's the same, same rocks. This is a map of Dover that was drawn in about 1660. And I like this map. It was in some of my materials. I like this map because to me it points out places, but it also shows the perspective that we today have the benefit of seeing things from above. And if you put yourself into the past, into the mind of a Native American, their perspective was always horizontal. They couldn't look down on things and make a map of where they were. So their sense of location and geography of where they are in space is based on what they can see and observe. So things like rivers, peaks, particular looking stones in, in their field of view and boundaries were what set the confines in their mind of their world. Whereas today we have the benefit of looking down at maps. So I want to point out a few things on this map that might help you get that perspective of it's not exactly north, south, east, and west as you would think of from the top down. It's more of thinking about the way that they saw things from ground level, looking across at things. So, here's the Charles River. Again, this is drawn without the benefit of looking down. Now, what is marked on this map from the 1600s is things like the old Indian path is marked here in the dashed line. And you notice that this path is parallel to the river. Because if you know that the river is on your side, on one side of you, you're not lost. And you can get a perspective on going north or south. You're not in the middle of the woods. You're following and you have enough view shed to know where you are, when you're, where you're going and how you can get there by using the river as your geographical reference. So here's the path. And then it says the pagan Indians here. It says Indian hunting grounds. Um, here it says native Indians north of Eliza Pagan. This says Reverend John Elliott's Indian village at Native, 1657. And it's marked right there. Um, this is a mark of a uh, brook. This says the primeval oak. This says Indians peculiar hunting place. I don't know what exactly that means. Uh, there's a couple other things. This says, this says um, Elliot's, this path joins up to this path that goes south. And it says Elliot's Indian path to Natick. And then this says, uh, Henry Wilson, 1640, and this says to Roxbury. <coughs> now, here's the important thing about this being situated in Dover in this configuration, is you notice the, the Native Americans are using the, the, the river, how the river is, is located to navigate. So, if they come up here and they're standing and they see the river to, in front of them to the north, they know they can get to Roxbury in the ocean by following that river east, generally, towards Neva, right? 
it's just a way, that's how they could think about, they didn't have maps per se, but they could use geography to figure out if they want to go south, they want to go towards um, Walpole or any of the towns south of Dover, they could follow that. A couple of other interesting things on this, this says the Powisset Indians, plains of the Powisset, Powisset. This says the, the peak of the, the um, Powisset, and this says trail to Powisset village. Uh, this says ancient quarry and Powisset rock shelter. And another part of this says right here, it says Indian dam. Now, what would they use a dam for? Well, that's part of how they would hunt, and Indians wouldn't if they lived in coastal settings, they would build a weir, and the weir is setting poles vertically into the sediment. And at high tide, the fish swim right over the poles, and then at low tide, the water leaks out between the poles, and the fish are caught behind it. It's a very simple way of getting your groceries. In a setting like the Charles River, where you have higher flow, they didn't need to go all the way across the river. They would basically build a fish trap by putting the poles out and pointing them upstream so some fish would get caught behind it as the river flowed. So you're just concentrating the fish in a place where they could use a tool to get those fish out of the water. And so this is where they go. So I, I would use a map like this as my starting point to look for Native American cultural remains. This would be my starting point. It's, it's not easy because there's not a lot of things here to go by, but it's better than nothing. Like, I could probably find this uh, because the shape of the river would be pretty close to exact. So I could get a pretty good idea of this. Uh, I could get an idea of what was going on on Poisset Peak. Again, remember, that was their tool source because it was Mattapan, it's made of Mattapan volcanics. Um, here's a little close-up. You can see it a little bit better on the close-up. So this is this would be Poisset Peak, Noannitz Brook here. This is between Noannitz Peak and the peak of the Poissets. So it gives you some perspective. Now these paths, if you can figure out where this path is, there's always Native American artifacts along these paths. And one thing I learned when I was trained to do archaeology and in my, my, my work in the field is when you think about there being artifacts, most people don't realize that there's an artifact outside this building in every 10 square feet. Think about that. Every 10 square feet has an artifact. And it's just a matter of could you recognize it? Maybe, but maybe it's buried six or eight inches, or maybe it's two inches. But there's an artifact. And when you combine that with historical artifacts, these are considered prehistoric, which means it was before the age of written history. That's prehistoric. Historic artifacts are those artifacts that are from the period after people learned to write and record history. This is another map. It's also, it's also from the mid-1600s. Uh, and it has a lot of good, really good information on it. Here's Medfield. It's spelled Meadfield. This was a map created of the campaign against Palmum and King Noannan. And here's, this is a little bit better map, it has Noannan's Hill. And right here has an interesting ID. It says Noannan's Castle. I don't know what that is, but I could probably find it. I could probably tell where it is if I were not looking for it. But this would tell me kind of where it is. And here it says Ye Dams. And there's several dams here on this stream that's called Noannis Brook or stream. Um, so he, his people were living there and, and they had this dam for a water source and probably also uh, for a source to, to birds, gather birds and other small mammals. Uh, and there's other interesting uh, locations on here, Pegan Hill. Uh, up here it says someone's weir. So they put weirs on the Charles River right there. Some more weirs. This over here, this is clapboard trees. This is Westwood. 
Um, this is you know, where Clapwood Tree Street is in Westwood. That's what it's named for. And so that's showing Westwood here. Um, yeah. But I thought this was a really, a really good map because it gives good perspective of where some Native American sites were and, and why it was close to their tool source and also the place to hunt. The Charles River is a migratory bird pathway. So, so since the place to scene, you had birds following the Charles River to, to, between Canada and the south. That, this is a migratory bird. They still use it as a major migratory bird pathway. And they've, they've done it because when they were small birds, they flocked with the older birds in their flock, and they took them the same way and just passed down. Even deer do that. Deer tend to pass down their pathways through the woods. And that's why today sometimes you see deer frequently going between the same houses all the time. It's because that's been passed down for centuries in those animals. They have, they're, they're taught, this is the way you go, where you go to get food, and this is where you get water. Animals do that. So the Charles River is a major bird migratory pathway, which meant it was a food source to Native Americans. Native American artifacts always concentrated near water bodies because that's where they hunted. So they would lose their tools, and that's why they're easier to find along water bodies. But at their tool source, I mean, I can look at Coisset and Noana and Strawberry Hill and see on the rock where they were working because of the way the rock, the rock looks. Here's, a, here's more of a, a close-up. Here's Noana. It's, it's weird right there. And... This is a trail, it must have been a crossing here because it says someone's crossing to Boston, Clapwood Tree, uh, and this is the Harper Trail. So that was going to Medfield, which became Route 109, was the mail route to Harper in Boston. Right? So that's, that's shown there. And again, these trails follow the water body right, right through. So this is a picture from the top. This is from the top of um, who is it? And it shows the volcanic rocks, the Napian volcanics. This picture I think is from Strawberry Hill, and it shows again the volcanic rock, the volcanic rocks, Strawberry Hill, Napian volcanics. When you look at a stone wall, when I look at a stone wall, I can tell if the stone wall is made of granite or if it's made of volcanic rock. And how you can tell is the volcanic rocks are always broken very angular. So as you drive around here, look at stone walls. And if you see the stones look kind of like basketballs, they're rounded and smooth. They're granitic. If they're kind of sharp and football shaped <coughs> and angular and sharp on the edges, they're volcanic in origin. So here's the the timeline, when we talk about the age of artifacts and dating artifacts, this is the timeline that archaeologists use. The Paleo Indian period, this is from the National Park Service, is 12,000 years ago to 9,000 years ago, years before present. The Archaic period is 9,000 to 2,700. The Woodland period is 2,700 to 400. And the Colonial period is 400 to 150. The colonial period is also known as the contact period. In the Paleo-Indian period, there were cooler temperatures, there's fewer point types, because there was more hunter and gatherer. They were hunter-gatherers, so they, were, they weren't living in a wigwam and going home every day. They were eating moving, going to the coast in the summer, going into the woods during the, the winter. You know, they, they didn't want to stay in the coast. They'd go to the coast in the summertime. So they were moving around more in the early period because the ice is now melting back. Things are opening up, and there's more food sources. So they were hunting these animals, including, including in, in Massachusetts. These animals were here. Uh, Wild grains, roots, seeds, nuts, fruits, and marine life. 
That's the paleo view. In the archaic period, the, the point types become more diverse. And the archaeologists, you might say, well, how do they know, you know an archaic point versus a paleo point? And that's because we use carbon-14 data, which measure, measures the breakdown of carbon-14 uh, over time. We know how long that takes. And we can actually date bone that's found with certain artifacts. So I did a site in Medfield that was a, a fire pit. And it was right at the intersection of Route 27 and South Street. We did three carbon dates on deer bone. We found deer teeth and deer bone in a fire pit that had arrowheads in it. So if we know the date of the deer bone, then we know the age approximately of when those arrowheads were being used. And one of the dates was 9,000 years ago, and one of them was 6,000. So people were living along South Street in Medfield between six and 9,000 years ago. And a lot of them, because we found a lot of artifacts at that site. This is a picture of the site, a site that I did on Elm Street in Medfield recently. Um, a man was building a house there. He didn't, his builder didn't realize that he was in an, we have an archaeological protection district in Medfield, and he didn't realize that he was in the district. He'd already started the work. So instead of asking him to hire a professional, they asked me to come out and help the historical commission in Medfield to do an excavation on his property to see if anything was there that might be uh, of interest because he was in this district. This is right next to Wheelock School. Do you know where the Wheelock School is? And this is a picture of his foundation hole. And remember at the beginning I showed you a slide of a big outwash plane with the braided streams coming out of the ice and making this big flat outwash plane. Well, this is what the geology looks like of that cross section. These are the gravel deposits in his open foundation that show the outwash plane coming out of the glacier. That's what this represents. And on top, this black layer is what people call the cultivated soil horizon. The cultivated soil horizon is the soil that is formed today, the organic matter that's been broken down over the last 12,000 years on the surface. And that's what the farmers tilled and, and planted. Now in Medfield, this soil is, is, has somewhat high concentration of very fine silt and clay, small percentage of clay. The problem with that is it's poorly drained. And so this kind of soil on top of an outwash plain that's, that really drains fast, but the soil on top is poorly drained. The reason for that is it's a kind of soil called loess. That's spelled L-O-E-S-S. -S. And it's the wind-blown silt that was blown around in front of the glacial ice. It's extremely soft and fine. It's not well-drained, and it's not good agricultural material. What it is good for, and what they used it for in Medfield, was growing hay and grass. And so that's why the hat factory in Medfield evolved, because Evie Mitchell had access to fields that were very good for hay and for grass, but not very good for root vegetables, because it's poorly drained. So, in this picture, it's a little hard to see, but you can kind of see the, the sediments going on an angle. That's because this was where the stream was flowing into a standing body of water. I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but these are angled like this, and on the top, it's horizontal, because this came first, where the stream was going down into a water body, a lake, and as the lake gets filled in, the streams go flat on top of the underlying center. So I set up here, the way you do it is you create squares, one foot squares, and you put the soil through a, an archaeological screen 
it's a quarter inch screen, and you can look at what comes up on the screen. It's really just to rule out, you know, there might be something <coughs> significant, there might not be, but in a place where it's been known, where there's been artifacts found before, it's good to survey it. It's, so this underlying soil beneath this dark, uh, loose soil is the, the original color of that loose, that wind-blown silk that was in front of the glacier. And it's very orange looking. It's very soft and it's very clean. The Native Americans loved to live on this surface because it didn't have all this 10,000 years of organic impacted loose on the top. This is so clean. You can walk around on that and bare feet, and you can brush your feet off and be perfectly clean. Here's a better picture of it uh, right there. So this, this dark, rich color is caused by the 10,000 years of grass growing and dying. and It's all organic matter in the soil column. And what I do is when I, when I do a pit, you take your iPhone or your phone, and you go on to uh, maps, and there's a little blue button that shows where you're standing. You touch that blue button, you push it down, and it brings up this page, which tells you the exact geographic coordinates of where you're standing. So for each pit, all I have to do is go on Google Maps, touch the blue button, this page comes up, and I take a screenshot right over where I've excavated. And that that locates exactly where I am, That's for the record. So in one of my pits, the last one I excavated, I found this, this uh, projectile point, and I actually I brought it. I don't know how visible it would be. This should just show you how big it really is. Okay, that's it. And you can take a look at it after. But this picture is good because it's a close-up. This was on the very bottom of that dark soil column. It was in the loose. And once you find an artifact like that, you have to look up. You have to identify the approximate age of it. So this book was written by a friend of mine. His name is Jeff Woodrow. And it's called Typology. And so it's a book that you can look up the different, different, these are all New England artifacts. And you can look them up. And he has corresponded these artifacts with COVID 14 dates and other sites all over New England. So you can get an idea of the age of the point that you find. So it's just another picture. So here, here's the point, and this is how I identify the age of. This point that I found eight, eight to ten inches underground, right next to Wheelock School. This is called the Neville uh, period, and it's the point of time that it comes from is late archaic, which means that this point was manufactured about eight thousand years ago. Now, if you think about that, it's been sitting in the ground next to Wheelock School for 8,000 years. 8,000 years. And until I found it. And there's, other and there's other artifacts near this site that I've been involved with excavations that correspond to the same time to this, including the ones that I did carbon 14 days along Route 27. And it's actually serrated on one edge, which is really interesting. And so whoever carried this and built it, walking along an ice margin on Elm Street in Medfield about 8,000 years ago. So the woodland period is between 2,700 and 400 years before present. What happens is they were hunter-gatherers, and then they started to become more sedentary as their populations grew and relying on each other. And in the woodland period, they actually start to cultivate seeds and staying put and growing things. More sedentary life. Corn is introduced from the Midwest. Um, there was just more trade. I found 
some chert rocks in the site in off South Street, about the size of your fist. And they're, they're very creamy and glassy looking. And we sourced that rock to the St. Lawrence Seaway. So we know that that group of people that living on Route 27, 8,000 years ago, were trading actively with Indians in the St. Lawrence Seaway because we found rocks that only come from that place. And they were using it to make tools, very sharp. These are pictures from Farm Street, from the Cheney property. And these are probably mm, archaic or older than woodland period, showing some of the materials that they use. And these are fell sites like you would get on Powisset, Noannet, Strawberry Hill. Uh, this is a woodland artifact. So most people look at this artifact and say, that's a tomahawk. <laughs> and that's not a tomahawk. And people, this was found um, on the Allen farm, which is I think off North Street in Medfield. I don't know whether you can see it, but it's big and heavy, and it has this groove that's <clears throat> called the hafting groove, which is where they connected it. This is where they would connect it to sticks or a split stick like that. And people would look at these and think that it's a tomahawk. It's not a tomahawk. It's way too heavy to pick up and chase people around with. <laughs> what this was used for, and this is how it gets dated to the woodland period, is that they connected this to a stick. And what is it? It's a hoe. It's, it's used. Yeah. These, this, this is really too heavy to be something to be chasing people and hitting. <laughs> this is something that women use because they were involved in that function of you use this to create a furrow in the soil and drag it. And, and when you drag it through the soil, you create a nice furrow and you drop the seeds in and you grow some. It wasn't to run around and hit people. Um, and this is from Medfield. And there's lots of these. A friend of mine on Main Street was putting a rhododendron in and he found one of these right next to his house. Um, there's other tools that are from that, from that. And Dover would have these too, like this. This is a gouge, chisel. So this is what they would use to hollow out a rotten log, open it up. And there's lots of these around too in the ground. You can't find them with a metal detector. <laughs> but when you look at these areas like the old map I showed you, you can get an idea of where they might be. That's for sure. Now I want to switch to historical archaeology, which is during historic time periods, like around the Carroll House or historic buildings. That's a, that's a separate aspect of archaeology. It's a really important one because it's the cultural history of the growth of North America. So it's the study of the materials and remains of past societies. It seeks to understand and document the emergence, transformation, and nature of our modern world, as we see. This is a map of the Denham Granted area. Here's Dover and Medfield. And I think most of you know that Denham once encompassed all of these towns. And so he just go over in that field and its connection to the river and the river being so important to place things geographically, how to get to the south, how to get to the ocean. That was the highway. And this is the Dwight Derby house that Jeff and I help out with in that field. So I did some of the original archaeology at the Dwight Derby house years ago. This is Electa Trich. And Bob Naughton, who was a detective in, in Medfield, he's a good friend of mine, he loved doing archaeology. And this is the back of the Dwight Derby house. We, we did archaeology before we added, added on a breezeway to the house. And we found the old original back door steps under the ground there when we started excavating. 
we found lots of bits of china porcelain and you know the threshold was because they used a thresh and brush things out the door that's why they call it a threshold and that's where you find a lot of uh, china the concept of municipal dumps and municipal trash areas doesn't come in until the 1930s and in some places the 40s so before those dates People threw trash in their backyard, right? And that's that's where the artifacts are. That's why there's an artifact in every 10 square feet. <laughs> because there was no town place to bring trash to. You put it in your backyard behind the stone wall. And if the pigs didn't need it, if it wasn't organic, then it's going to stay in the soil for sometimes centuries. So we excavated in the back here. This is how we laid out one meter square so we could keep track of where we were digging and where we were finding things. And what we did find here, right behind the Dwight Derby house, was the original farmer's well. So you see how these rocks are in a circle? And here is the original well to the property. And wells were hand dug wells. They were usually dug by children because the farmer would put his son into the well. And he would go down and pass up the buckets of soil one by one. And that's why these houses, most of the time, are built close to a brook or a stream because the groundwater under the house is going to be as if you projected the water in the stream next to the house underneath. So if you're 50 feet away from a brook, the water level in that brook goes right straight on the ground under the house, so it's shallow. So you wanted to build these houses close to water so you didn't have to dig very far to dig your well. So this is the original well right across from the Derby House is what's called Baker's Pond, which is part of Vine Lake, uh, not Vine Lake, part of um, Vine Brook, <coughs> goes past the Dwight Derby House. So that's, so, and these wells are always full of artifacts. They used to throw all the, once they didn't use the well anymore, all the trash went down in the well. Just fill it up. And here's some of what was in the well. Old shoe, some organic matter. This, but I, I never finished excavating it. I actually left it alone. And it's, it's got a hatch, so we can open it up and show it to kids and whatnot. This is a different archaeological perspective. It's a picture looking out a window, right? The reason I took this, this was a house, an antique house, historic house in Medfield on Phillips Street. And this house was demolished. It was knocked down. What I've done a few times for the town is when a house is going to be demolished, I go in and I photograph it, everything from the join, joining of the beams. You don't want to knock down um, an early architectural house in your town without documenting what was there. And one of the things I like to document is what did they see from this house? What did that person look out and see? And so I wanted to take pictures out the window. This house is gone now, but now we have a record of what the person that lived there, what he saw when he looked out his family, could see out the window before it was completely gone. This was his planting field. He could look out and see that. And this was off Phillips Street as well. This is one of the um, the only known forts from King Philip's War. And it's at the end of Philip's Street, it's in the woods. Um, a friend of mine helped to reason where this would be. And with some local knowledge, we found it. And so this, this is on what was called the road to Dedham. And it's, it's, um, it's a big area. It looks like a burn in the woods. But what it was was they were afraid that the Indians were going to attack Medfield from Denham. And so they wanted to be prepared. So the colonists built, and this is on some old maps, they wanted to build a fort that was a defensive place where they could protect the town from an attack by the Native Americans. And so it's still there. And it's probably, I think it's maybe the only one left. In the state. And here's another picture of them. You can see them a little better, these little mounds of earth. Um, and that was built in 1675. And it was built 
under the direction of the king, <laughs> not a president. Uh, and so this is from my own garden in Medfield. So all of you probably work outside and around soil in your backyards and so forth. This is in my own garden in Medfield, and I'm just a person that's always looking. And you see a lot of these clay pipe stems around. And these were from Holland. The farmers used to smoke them while they were working the fields. And I'm sure there's loads of them in, in, in Dover around the older properties and fields inside the stone walls. And they just look like a little broken piece of clay pipe. And in this one, it still has the end, the mouthpiece. And right here, if you could see this, I don't know if you can see it on here, but right here you can actually see where the farmer was chewing on it. It still has the marks on the end of the clay pipe of where his teeth were, were, were biting it. Uh, sometimes they have the maker's mark on the side, and you can actually date these by the size of the hole down the middle of it. The hole size changed over time, so that's how archaeologists date the time period that these come from. And these are buttons and, and a marble, a redware marble, which is probably 18th century marble. This is a some buttons, a Victorian black button. This button is made out of wood, and those are some glass buttons. Again, they were in my 30 by 30 garden that I wrote it to. In the 1930s, and how some of these artifacts were found were farmers, after they would plow their field and then it would rain, the farmers would find Native American artifacts in their fields. And they would just bring them in the house and put them on their mantle. And they, there was a period when farmers got interested in collecting Native American artifacts. And they used to report them to the state. So the state has an archive that the general public does not have access to about where these finds come from. And I'm authorized to talk to the state. If, if somebody was going to build a house on a piece of land, then the state can share with me what's nearby that was found in the 1930s by a farmer. And that gives me a context of, it was just something, it was popular in the 1930s the 20s and 30s, that they found artifacts and they would report them. So the state has a, a database, and it's it's one of the only things that's protected from FOIA. You can't do a Freedom of Information Act and look at where these are. It's protected. And the reason for that is that they didn't want people to pot it. They didn't want people to take those locations and go out with a shovel and start, and start digging. Uh, but these are pretty much everywhere. A lot of times, if you wanted to look around your own house, uh, or if it's an old house, you would look around the gutter line, because when the rainwater washes the stones in the soil near the corner of the house where the gutter comes down, many times you can find these clay pipe stems there. Um, and here's a good place where it probably has a few of those. These houses, like the Carroll House, the way they built these, probably maybe you all know this, but these houses were built first by digging a big hole in the ground and then building a freestanding foundation in that hole. And then once the foundation is in, they would backfill the space around the outside of the foundation. And that's called the builder's trench. And in the builder's trench, there's always a lot of artifacts because the guy that was working on the house in 1775, he dropped a coin, or he dropped a tool. These builder's trenches right around the edges are archaeologically uh, and historically archaeologically rich. So when you're going to do any significant work in close proximity to a historic property, you want to be mindful of how deep you're digging and where you're digging because there's always a lot of historic artifacts around these, these antique houses that tell you something about the life and lifetime of the people that lived in them. So you don't want to just dig it up and put it in a truck and cut it off. So that's it. Anybody have any questions?
I have a question. Sure. I think it was spelled two T's or one T, which is the correct spelling. You know, I I don't know, but I that poison is sounds like it's named after an Algonquin station. There's actually two spellings. I was gonna say that the street is spelled with two T's. Yeah. Far is spelled with one. Right. I know. Yeah. <laughs> you would know, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Originally a lot of these old old English words like Medfield was M E A D. You know, um, they they've been transposed, and the best dictionary of Algonquin words is was done by Roger Williams of Rhode Island. He he did a dictionary of Algonquin words, and that and he wrote phonetically to what he was hearing with English letters. So I'm sure that that's why. That's why. Yeah, he, he was hard to understand. That. Yeah. Uh, the igneous rocks that are made, used for tools, do they vary from areas? And if they do, can they be determined by mass spec? Yes. From, do they, they do a lot of that. Yeah, so what he asked was, do the, these igneous rocks that Native Americans use for tools, do they vary in different places? And they absolutely do. And they even vary in the same place. Because, like, let's take Poisset, for example. The rocks at Poisset were formed in an eruption, kind of like Mount St. Helens, which was called a crypto-explosive eruption where, where magma intersected with water from the ground. And so it was a very explosive eruption. And that creates a specific type of, of rock that has a lot of silica in it. You can have a lot of potassium, a lot of sodium minerals at different feldspars. And the ones that are high silica, like that poisset, which is a rhyolite, can be chemically analyzed using what you say, a mass spectrometer, but they can actually count the different ratios of the different kinds of minerals in them and give it a name, an exact name. Is this a rhyolite? Is this an andesite? What exactly is this? But there's a range, whenever you have these volcanic mixtures, they're there. The, the Native Americans were looking for the, the glassier ones, the felsites, the rhyolites, because they're easily chipped into very thin and very sharp edges. And really, when most people look at these projectile points, they're not, they weren't fixed on bow and arrows. Most of these tools were used as throwing tools. Even you see like the one that I found, that wasn't on the end of an arrow. That was on the end of a long reed, like a long reed grass, because they would go after a skunk or a woodchuck. With that, they weren't they weren't like that bows and arrows are late. They're more like getting closer to woodland period tools rather than in the beginning it was mostly putting the tool on a long stick or a light reed grass and, and throwing it or poking something that's in his burrow. That's what they that's what they use those for. But Dover has a really good and well used mind for um, using the volcanic rocks by indigenous peoples for tools. Anybody else? What were yeah. the funeral and the burial arrangements uh, for Native Americans? What did they do? Well, that that kind of varies through time. Jeff and I were talking about this before the talk. Um, That's what people like us talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you have to think about because I've, I've looked at some of these these grave sites and and reasoned out where they are is they used common sense in the base case. And the common sense says, if you were going to, to bury someone, would you go to the top of Poisset, or would you go into the gravels of the stream deposits lower down in the elevation, or would you go down next to Noannix Brook and bury somebody there? Common sense says, you're not going to go to the top of that peak and dig a hole, because you're going to hit rock at about two inches 
So you, you wouldn't do that. You don't want to go down to the very base of the valley because the water table is too high and their practice was not to bury people. So the ones that I've seen, the places I've seen in burials is more sort of in between. Later on, when you get closer to contact period burials, there's more of a, I don't even want to say religious component, but a component of the organization and orientation of the burial means something to us. And it might be that, you know, sunrise had a very important meaning. So they wanted a place that is uh, visible to sunrise. So it might be a little higher up. One of the places we thought was a very likely place for Native American <coughs> life and life and burial was the gravel <coughs> hill where Tresca Brothers is, is excavated. Because that had a location that was right on the Charles River, faces the east, early sunrise, and it's deep, thick gravels, which are easy to dig in. So most of them are not in the highest elevations or the lowest elevations. And they, while they hunted in the lower elevations, they, they didn't, they didn't plant. They planted some things at lower elevations, even in the Charles River Valley. But that's the earliest frost, right? Like the lower you get in elevation, you have hills and you have valleys. The first frost is going to be closer to the water. So planting fruit bushes, things, you want them up, preferably facing the southwest. And you want it on, on a valley sidewall not on the bottom and not on the top. Top's too hard to dig in. The bottom is too wet and too cold for most of the year. So a lot of their activity is right in that, just above the flood plain, <coughs> even for burial. And the colonists were buried in what, what we, the glacial geologists, would call a drumlin. The drumlin is a small football-shaped hill if you go to Charlestown and you look at um, the early grave graveyards over there, they're, they're all in these little drumlings, they're little mouths, glacially deposited mouths, because the water table is lower there. They wanted people up where it was higher and drier and easier digging. Yeah. Um, have you, well, do you know where the, the closest Paleo Indian? Artifacts have been found where we are. I've not read about them. The, I'm talking about Clovis, yeah. etc. The earliest, the Clovis areas, closest ones to here, are, I believe, in Canton, off Route 95. Right off Route 95. And you're driving northbound on Route 95, over to the east. I think that was where. There was a really interesting find when they redid a playground. I don't know if it was in Hyde Park, somewhere, and they were putting in some new equipment for kids, and they found wrapped in the ground some very early points and also uh, a whale effigy. So it was a carved whale uh, wrapped in like reed grass with some really interesting spear points that we use presumably for whaling. In fact, it moved back the date that archaeologists thought people were actively whaling in Boston Harbor. When they found this grouping of artifacts with a whale effigy, they decided to move the date back, I think it was like more than 500 years earlier that Native Americans were actively whaling in Boston Harbor. But the nearest call at this point, I think it's the Canton site. We have uh, put some of them on display, um, uh, a number of uh, Native American artifacts in the Solwyn Museum, which come from the Dover area, or similar to the ones you've described. Yeah, and again, mine, the ones from Medfield, who were owned by the town, were found by the farmers. And it was yeah. during this time period, and they put these little little red bordered labels on them. 
he, you know, the farmer would write tomahawk. And, and then when I started my group in Medfield, people would come in and say, look what I found, you know? And there was a girl walking her dog uh, off Frary Street. <clears throat> she comes in and she has a blade that was about eight inches long and it was serrated like a steak knife. And she found it walking her dog to a little wetland area. So uh, another person found a similar artifact in a garden on Rhododendron Drive, which is right off 27. Once you raise the awareness and people are kind of looking at the ground, um, there's not as much agriculture farming going on, but I wouldn't be surprised if Poissa has their own box of artifacts somewhere from the agricultural work that's done there. Just, and also because it's so close to the, the, the source material, the Manapan volcanics are a really important and very important source material for Native Americans, for tool Native Americans. I'll have to take a look at this. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you very much. We want to thank you all for coming. At this point, we'll adjourn the meeting, and uh, uh, I'm sure John will stay around for a while if you have other, any questions. Uh, one thing that I don't think you mentioned, John, which is stuck in my mind from the last time you spoke, yeah. was that the glacier that covered us was what? Uh, how many thousand feet? 5,000 feet? It was between, it was at least more than 5,000 feet. It was more than 5,000 feet of ice above where we're sitting right now. And how do we know that? Because remember at the beginning I showed you a slide that showed you how dirty the, the, the glaciers were. They, we called them the dirt machine. Well, that, that glacial till, all those rocks that are in trained in the glacier, well, there's some of those on top of Mount Washington. So how could you have, uh -oh. how could you have those broken rocks that are inside the ice on the top of Mount Washington? unless the ice was at least 6,000 feet thick there, right? So that explains, and if you go to what uh, Poisset and Noanna and Strawberry Hill, they're about 500 feet, right, elevation. I don't know what their relief is. It's probably a few hundred feet. This till on top of those peaks. So you, you can't get the till on top of those peaks unless the ice was <laughs> thicker than that. So that's how they reason that the ice in New England was at least a mile thick. Um, here, you know, it ended at Block Island and Cuddy Honk, Martha's Vineyard, Cape Cod. That was the, the terminus, that edge, Long Island, terminus of the continental ice sheet. And that was about 17,000 years ago when that started to... So 17,000 years ago, southern Rhode Island and Connecticut was was under ice. By 13,000 years ago, Dover was becoming ice free. So within, you know, within that eight to 10,000 years, there was a lot of melting going on. But, but that's a long time. I once did a talk where I brought in 10,000 sheets of paper. I went to the store and I bought a couple of files. I wondered, I just wondered if I stacked up paper and said, this is how, how much 10,000 years is. And the snap was like four feet, <laughs> over four feet high. And then I, I took the top hundreds sheets and I said, this is a lifetime. And that's 10,000 years. And that's how long people have been living here. This is our life. It's 100 pieces of paper. And this is 10,000 pieces of paper. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. And this this artifact is eight thousand years old. This this man made artifact that was in the hands of one person it was in a person's hands eight thousand years ago. So you're suggesting it's early archaic then? Late archaic. Well that's not eight thousand years. It's about eight five. Something like but doesn't the archaic end about uh, just before the uh, uh, early woodland, about 700 years well, well, before, I mean, yeah, 2700. Yeah, like yeah, early. 
Yeah. No, I, I'm into chronology. Is you like chronology? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But there's a way of putting that, if I may ask. You're in, you're in the uh, I believe it was. It may have been. I don't know. I have to look in just. Okay. okay. Well, just, okay. But the, how you how you know that is is really from the, from its base. So see the shape of the base. It's sort of an open base, and that's how this falls into that chronology. I'll look at it much enough. Yes, I guess but, curious because it's old. It's really oh, old. this is, and it's handmade. <laughs> you know, that's a handmade piece. That's old. Which which. Like these pieces, this is, so chronology, this is your woodland, woodland here, right? So this is a 2,700, and again, this is when farming, farming becomes, this is, this is hunter-gathering, this is them becoming farmers. Yep. What do you think about half did piece? I mean, the half is modern. I made it just yeah. for fun. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, this, but this I is don't think years old. it was for plowing. I would have thought, because it's very thin, if you look at it, look yeah. at the... Oh, you mean vein, this is a fine? The vein, the, yeah. the vein of felsite yep. running through it, they Achoo. choose that very carefully. Sure. I'm going to say this just to you privately afterwards, but since we're all here still. Yep. They knew what they were doing. They did. Yeah. What they, how, how would you place that woodland? This is almost, I mean, it almost looks ceremonial to me, more than like an actual use, because it only has one chip right there. So it's not used much. It's built, but I don't see a lot of... Um, yeah, not much, no pot, not, not much use where. Yeah, that's what I mean. in a field. Yeah. Not and, in Dover, I should say. And, and, that, and also this banding that you pointed out leads me to think that it's, it can be more of a ceremonial pieces. And I have several ceremonial pieces that I've found in Medfield. One is a, one is a rod, a stone rod, and the end of it is shaped like a snake head. It was found in a farmer's field next to an apple tree. So they did have some ceremonial pieces, and we don't see a lot of wear use on this. Um, anything hafted has, is going to be probably woodland or, or, or more recent. Yep. Yeah. I just want to say thank you sure, thank for you. bringing everything up. I am native, 80% native, and I think you did a fabulous job. No, thank oh. you very thank much. much. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. That's thank great. You. Okay, well, thanks again, everybody. Good night, Jennifer. Enjoy it. Thank you.